but our topic will be uh, recognizing uh, your your treasure despite the tricks. Recognizing your, I'm sorry, recognizing you're a treasure uh, despite the tricks. Um, and kind of from the, uh, the subtitle angle, real worth, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about our real worth, our real significant si- significance, because it's amazing. Like, we spend so much time uh, uh, pleasing folk. Remember, there was a, a, a year, uh, you know, we write a vision every year for our house. But one of those years, the Lord was like, well, Keith, this year I need you to take your choices back. And I remember... <laughs> So I was like, Lord, take my choices back. He says, yeah, because most of the decisions you make is based on what everybody thinks you should be doing. Or it's uh, uh, very admirable decisions, but it's about pleasing everybody else. Now, that was a challenging year for me, but it probably was a more, more of a challenging year for all the people that had trained that I would be there for all the time. <laughs> you know, so sometimes they would call me and whereas normally – they probably, it was like a guarantee, you know. I, you know, worst case scenario, I'll just call Keith. He'll be there, you know. Regardless of what he's doing, he'll stop what he's doing. And I wasn't doing that that year. I was making choices. So, you know, I would make, I would respond with statements like, uh, I'm not going to be able to do that right now. But I wouldn't explain. <laughs> you know, I was just like, I'm not going to be able to do that. So why not? You know, there's some people like, well, why not? <laughs> well, no, one person I said, I'm not going to be able to do that right now. Well, wh- well what time can you do it? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not going to be able to do it at all. And, uh, and, and not because I, you know, I was against anybody. I just was trying to live out the choice. If something I was available to do, I, of course, I'd still do it. But if I wasn't capable of doing it, I wasn't putting myself in situations that was having a, um, a domino effect. <laughs> and I realized, matter of fact, I think around that time I read the book, uh, The Search for Significance, the, the women had got the book at our old church, so my wife had it, and I just snatched it up and started reading it. And I really saw how a lot of my choices was based on everyone else's significance or or my my value was what, what other people thought of me as opposed to what God was saying is what I learned through uh, reading that book. And, and, and I'm going to reference some things from the book as we go through the, to uh, what we're talking about today. So again, uh, we're talking about today recognizing your treasure despite their tricks. Uh, uh, when I was reading that book, it Search for Significance, it was uh, it is shared a story of a, uh, the book opens up with the, with the story of a guy that was in a car accident. Well, he was rushing, he was, he could have slept in a hotel or whatever, but he just wanted to get home. So as he was trying to, on his way home, he ended up in a car accident. So he, he, he flips over on the side of the road. So when he flips over on the side of the road, he, he actually, he recognizes his blood, but he gets out the car. But when he gets out the car, he realizes, I can't really walk. And so he falls down next to the, next to the car. And uh, so he hears a car coming, but he can't get to the car. But he feels, I'm fine. Like, like he said to himself, yeah, I was probably not that bad. That's why he was trying to get up the walk. He's like, I'm cool. You know, I mean, man, this could have really been serious is what he was saying to himself. And so the car that drove by stops. So when the car stops, the people uh, pull over. The, the wife had saw the corner of her eye. She saw that there was a car flipped over. So they came and they pulled over and they saw the guy sitting by the car. And when they looked and they saw him and they saw blood everywhere, they was like, oh, my God. And then so he saw their faces and then he started to see his blood because, you know, now blood is coming out. And he realized he started to shake because he realized, like, I just was in a a serious accident. Like, he didn't really think it was that serious. And when they got him to the hospital, they told him, they said, well, if those people hadn't came by, which the lady just happened to see him out of the corner of her eye, if they hadn't came by, you would have died. So the interesting thing is this guy's on the side of the road thinking, man, this was a, I, my car flipped over, but whew, glad nothing really happened to me. <laughs> and the whole time, he, he's, he's somebody driving by away from his death. Now, the interesting thing is you say, wow, this guy was almost dying and didn't recognize it. Well, he was in shock. So the effect of his wounds hadn't kicked in yet. 
The interesting thing about that is that's what we go through in our lives. Like we're, we go through accidents in relationships and with people. We're driving down our road of life and we get flipped over. <laughs> and when we're flipped over, it has an effect. But we say this grand statement, I'm good or I'm all right. Or, you know, man, that could have really hurt me, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm fine. Now, we're saying we're fine, but we're like the guy on the side of the road. It's affected us more than we realize, but the shock of the, the betrayal or the shock of the, uh, of the hurt, uh, we haven't really recognized the effect of the wounds yet. <laughs> so a lot of times we're walking around with an effect that, that um, everyone else sees but us. Why we don't, we're not recognized and we're not dealing with the reality of the impact. Right, so, uh, <laughs> so what we do uh, is when we're affected, if we don't embrace the reality of the impact, at that moment we create uh, a secret compartment. <laughs> and in that secret compartment, we put the effect of the situation in or the reality of the effect. Because the effect is already, always, you know, touching people all the time. You just don't know it. But, but so we just put it over there in the secret compartment. So we walk around like it's all good because we don't even look in this secret compartment. You know, like you have a junk drawer. <laughs> like You don't know what's in there until you're moving. And you're like, man, I was looking for that like three years ago. <laughs> and it's buried in there. Well, well that's what happens. We, we create these secret comp comp uh, compartments. So now... We were living a whole life until the interruption. We were on our path to fulfillment. Now we're living a compartmentalized life. So we have a life that we present in front of church folk. We have a life that we present in front of family. We have a life that we present in front of our extended family. Then we have a, a life that's in that room when no one's around. <laughs> You know, that first, that life that don't nobody know about, but it's there. Then there's a life that we haven't even seen. We feel it, but we pretend it's not there. Or we try to numb ourselves to it, it, it calling us. So that, that life says, hey, I just want to know, are we going to discuss um, what happened and the effect that, that that situation had on you today? And then... Uh, you, you numb it, you, or you get busy. You find something to do. It's like, well, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. And time just keeps going by. But the whole time, it's, uh, it's sabotaging you from time to time. You know, it happens, uh, it happens with pastors or leaders. You know, they, uh, they're eloquent speakers, but they haven't really figured out how to connect with their family or how to talk with their family. So, the, the flamboyant, aggressive person that, you, you, sit, sit down over there, or, or, or that's not how we do things. You sit in the front row at the house, you don't know what to say to his kids, daughters, or nobody, but nobody sees that. They just see the surface. You know what I'm saying? You see it, uh, you see it with athletes, you know. I mean, they're running through tackles and all types of stuff, but they can't deal with any adversity at home. You know, they don't have the patience to deal with their relationship. They don't have the patience or do they really sometimes even care to go the extra mile to have that follow through conversation. So that's what happens when you're affected, but you figured out a way uh, to hide. We want to wake up to see. And the interesting thing about seeing, when you wake up, the first thing you do is you search for truth. You know, I, you know, uh, growing up in, a, in a, a foster home, I lived this compartmentalized life for a long time. I lived a hiding life. Actually, I was watching a video. <laughs> I was editing video the other day. And some of the stuff that, that was being said through this vessel, I was like, I wonder what, the people that were around when I was, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much being transparent, but at the time, I'm just, the Lord's just using me, right? <laughs> so then I started to think, like, there was people there. <laughs> so they probably was like, seriously? You, you were a foster kid? I, 
I would convince people that even the people that raised me, they were my grandparents. They weren't my grandparents. They were foster parents. Somebody's going to hear this and like, seriously, get out of here. You know what I'm saying? Because it was just taboo to be adopted or, or be the foster kid. So, you know, so I was fronting about a lot of stuff. I was just faking a lot of, just making up stuff as I went along, acting like I knew stuff. So I was just thinking about that, like, you know, just living this compartmentalized life for a long time. Then I, I remember uh, one of the people that, okay, so you had the foster parents, they had children, they had grandchildren our age. So we were talking one time, and one of them figured out that I wasn't their real cousin. So we're on the porch talking to, to the fellas, like the boys in the neighborhood. It's like, yeah, so I hear them talking. I roll up, and he's like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he said that, that, that you're a foster child. Oh, see, they didn't tell him. No, they didn't tell him. No, that's my real grandmother. But he didn't, nobody told him. You know, he young, ain't nobody tell him. He ain't know. He ain't know. I, I created a lie on the fly. You know what I'm saying? Like, as like, a matter of fact, we never talked about it until, I think, uh, either earlier this year or last year, he's in uh, Boston. And we were talking about it. And I said, remember that day? <laughs> You know, so I, I said that to say, like, so for me, for a long time, I was living that compartmentalized life, too. You know, not necessarily embracing the reality of your life. You know what I'm saying? You know, feeling like you have to hide. But when I woke up, I remember telling my dad this. I said, Dad, when the smoke clears and you wake up, you just want to know, how'd you even get here? Could I just get there? Because some, some, somebody tell me who made the choices that put me in the position where I was in this situation. The first thing you search for is truth. Now let's go to John 8. John chapter 8. This is going to be good. You know, and what we're talking about here is recognizing your, you are a treasure despite their tricks. The adversary has some tricks. And we don't want to be ignorant of his devices, but he's trying to convince us that we're, we're, that we have, we're of no worth. You know, like with Eve, he tried to convince her that she, she didn't have enough. Oh, no, no, you don't have enough. You need more. And God's trying to stop you from that. See, once he convinced you you don't have enough, then now you have to be open to what else do I need? <laughs> and so now that's when the game start. Soon as you start thinking you're not enough, that's when the game start. That's when you start to get manipulated. So here it says in John chapter 8, um, verse 32, it says, And you shall know... Uh, be intimate with the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the truth is a freeing thing. But the interesting thing is you notice how there's a, a defense mechanism to even deal with the truth. I mean, some people are so embedded that, <laughs> uh, now again, I'll use me because, you know, some of y'all might not roll like this. But I remember years ago when I would tell a lie, you know, I stopped lying in college because I realized, what am I lying for? Like, it's not like you're going to get a spanking, you know, like at this age. You know, so when I was in college, I said, why am I lying to these people? But before then, not only did I lie, but you could talk to me like three years later. I'd be like, oh, nah, 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 I didn't do that. Because it's three years later, I can't get in trouble. So now I'm so busy trying to prove I can trick somebody. Three years later, I'm still telling you, nah, nah, no, no way. Nah, nah, I didn't do that. Mm -mm, nah. So look, so it's a default at that point, right? Where it's like you're, you're not even living in reality. You're not even living in truth. And so as I've grown, because once you put on truth lenses, you recognize lies quick. <laughs> you put on them truth lenses, you be like, why are you lying? <laughs> like, why is you just lying? Why don't you just tell the truth? We got to start embracing the truth. Now we're free. Soon as we start embracing the truth, we reattach ourselves to our value and our worth from God. See, the truth means final reality, finished product. It's, it's the, 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 the butterfly that evolves from the caterpillar. So it's what, we're, so it's what God designed us to be, not just where we are at this particular position in time in our life. So that's why truth is going to be important for us. And as we're going through this particular teaching, uh, there's a lot of truth that's going to hit you.